Right, Jack Straw, thank you very much um, for, for letting me speak to you. Um, firstly, uh, just a couple of questions uh, about you as a politician. Um, have you noticed that over the past year or so, you've started to become regarded as something of an elder statesman in the party? Yeah, I have. Uh, it's caused me a great shock, uh, concern, upset. Uh, indeed, I noticed uh, the other day I was re referred to as a veteran. I was saying to my wife, it certainly seems a blink of the eye when I was uh, a rising star, but there you go. <laughs> so, um, obviously, we're entering a period of transition. Well, anyway. Um, Briefly. Depends, <laughs> it depends what you mean by transition, but uh, whether, whatever epithet is attached to me, um, I feel I've got plenty of energy um, and uh, want to keep making my contribution to the party and the government. In particular, we're coming up to probably one of the hardest general elections yeah. we've had for a while. Um, what, what challenges have we got in that short period of well, years? It will be uh, the hardest election we've had since 92. What's crucial is that we uh, make it a better result uh, than 1992. In 92, we couldn't say what we had done, how we would transfer form the, uh, the country. We couldn't point to a record, merely to promises. Now we can uh, point to a record. We've got to use the next two years to build on the incredible platform that Tony Blair has provided which, in a headline, is about making this country much more prosperous uh, and much fairer, social justice and economic prosperity. And I think we are doing that across the piece. It's very interesting. People who've been abroad for quite a long time come back and say, by God, this country's changed and changed for the better, even if they're not uh, our way. I think we could have sent the majority of the population abroad for a few years. They right. Could have. right um, one last question about your, your history as a politician. Um, Home Secretary's got a lot of grief. Yeah. Did you ever envisage that today would come along and you'd be, your tenure would be looked back on fondly by um, civil liberties campaigners? Uh, it has a lovely irony uh, about that. Uh, but on the other hand, I tried very hard to keep these guys on board at the same time saying, look, you know, life's tougher out there. Um, I was uh, personally brought up on a council estate um, where there weren't many police around uh, and life was tough. and. We've been trying to protect the people who are most vulnerable, not necessarily the people living in large houses, though they need protection too, but people on council estates, former council estates, of relatively low income. And it's a nightmare if you're like that, on the margin, and you've got some really dreadful neighbours, or there's a gang down the street, or your kids have been dragged into drugs. And that's what we've been trying to sort out. And I don't regard that as against civil liberties. Mm. Well, your current portfolio, um, uh, you've got a historic period coming up in terms of um, what you're doing to the place. Yeah. Um, can you quickly, very quickly outline the bullet well, points on what you're going to do to the... Labour Party's Party. been committed to reform of the House of Lords for 100 years, uh, so in my view it's probably now time to get on with it. Uh, we removed the right of most hereditary peers, all but 92, uh, to sit in the House of Lords, but we've got a lot more to do. Um, we're committed to removing those hereditaries, we're also committed to a free vote on composition. I don't know which way it's going to go, I've actually shifted my own view, and I'm now really pretty strongly in favour of what we call a hybrid house, a mainly 50-50 or mainly elected house, but with an appointed element as well, and I think that would work, and be better suited and better fit in with where the public are than the current all appointed for life house. Would, would you call this an incrementalist approach? Well it is an incrementalist approach because it would have to take place over say 15 years. Uh, the one thing where everybody's clear about, each party is clear about, is that you cannot effect a major change from having an all appointed for life house, which is where you are at the moment, to say a mainly elected house um, in the space of a sh small number of years. It wouldn't work um, and you'd run into a logjam over legislation. As, as party members, uh, some party members, I'm not going around talking to 100,000 of them, but um, a number of party members have said to me, not quite sure why we're having transition arrangements. Why, what you've just said there, yeah. why would it not work? Why would it work? Well, you, you would run into real difficulties in getting the legislation through. Because they but, would block us. Yeah, because they would block it. And then you people say, well, why can't you just bash on with the Parliament Act? But you, mm. And no one is suggesting for a moment that the powers of the Commons in respect to the Parliament Act should be removed. But where you're dealing with very large-scale constitutional change of this kind, you need to try and maintain as much of a consensus as possible. Otherwise it won't bed in and you get another party coming in and they will then change it. And that doesn't, you know, that's all right if for something it's just highly partisan. If the mm -hmm. Tories want to change the minimum wage, I mean, I, I will fight them tooth and nail, but 
that's in a sense where they are, because they don't agree with the minimum wage. But you shouldn't change your institutional structure, which is what everybody should be agreed mm -hmm. about, um, except with great care. Now, we're using great care, but I also believe we've got to get on with it. Well, we've, we've made dramatic changes, I mean, particularly if you look at um, anti-discrimination legislation. Yeah, sure. And we didn't sort of have an incrementalist approach to we that. We, it was like, discrimination wrong, let's do what sure. it takes. No. Isn't, aren't sort of people who aren't peers being discriminated against? Isn't it uh, class discrimination? Well, I agree with that, and you could argue that we should have been clear about what we wanted and then put it in the manifesto and gone ahead. But it, and, and you're right, we, we did that on discrimination. I'm proud to have played a very important role, I think, in bringing in that legislation. We're the only government that's ever brought in uh, anti-discrimination legislation, and it's a very important part of what we've been about. Ditto in respect of human rights. We said we're going to have a Human Rights Act. We didn't say we're going to consult on it, have a free vote. So we are going to have a Human Rights Act. We are doing devolution to Scotland and Wales, and then we got on with it. But the Lord is one of these issues uh, about, the, as it were, the structure of the heart of our democracy, which arouses very strong passions. Um, the Labour Party is split on it, the Tory Party is even more split, the Liberals are split too. So in the real world, it's either you move forward slowly, but in that direction, or in the in practice, uh, you don't make progress at all. And it's the parable of the tortoise and the hare. <laughs> So you do envisage there being a future Lords Reform Bill um, after, sometime if, after this one's better to... If, I mean, assuming, which is now a reasonably large assumption, but assuming that we can get a clear result in the vote, which is coming up early next month, so we know what the view of the Commons is, um, then we'll then take stock, and if the, if the vote is clear enough, then uh, a new Lord's Bill would be a good candidate for legislation. But you are, but hereditary days are numbered. Hereditary days are numbered. They have been numbered since 1997, and we were due to get rid of all of them. There was then a compromise, and we ended up with this rather uh, eccentric, wonderfully British system where the hereditaries formed an electoral college to elect their number, some of their number. So about 600 hereditaries now elect 92 to sit in the Commons on their behalf. Um, but they're still there because they're their fathers or grandfathers, son or grandson, and nothing more. Often we, have, we hear about the hereditaries, and they're described very much as an independent, non-partisan force yeah. in, in the Lords. Really? Um, well, because you, you've heard these arguments yeah. about them being randomly picked. Oh, it's all nonsense, they're not randomly picked at all. Um, look, they, they, you just believe they don't belong there? Well, um, I don't think you can justify having people in a legislature by virtue of their birth. Is it's, that any part of the legislature? Sorry, I'm, I'm talking about the monarch in particular. Well, I think the, no, the monarch's not part of the legislature, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, with great respect. So if that's where you're taking me to, there's a, there's a, you, we, we have shown, and so have other countries, that it's possible to have uh, a monarchy. Um, at the head of a highly democratic structure, um, but they're outside government in, and they're outside legislation in practice, whatever the theory. So you can have a constitutional monarchy, which is what we've got, and you know, I think our system works at least as democratically as the Republic of France does, which is a presidential system. Um, so that's that. But on the hereditary peers sitting in the House of Lords legislating, uh, no, they shouldn't be there. And, we're committed to uh, removing the uh, right of these remaining hereditaries to sit there as hereditaries. Um, and I hope that we can achieve that and build up a, a consensus uh, for doing that. And it simply isn't the case that the hereditaries are there are capable of exercising greater independence of judgment. I mean, of the 92, um, almost half are actually Conservative peers. I mean, the, we and the Liberals have just a handful between us of the hereditaries, which tells its own story. Uh, the others are so-called non-party, uh, but uh, no prizes for how they normally vote. Um, <coughs> yes, sorry, we're come, come very nearly done. Um, your um, tenure as uh, leader of the Commons, Yeah. Um, is this going to be it? Is this going to be the big bang, or have you got a few other things up your sleeve you want to get done oh, before right, your... Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, that depends on the Prime Minister of the day, uh, but there's a lot of spit left in me. I mean, you've got, you've got a little list that you're put, pitching forward to, or ready to pitch I'm forward into Cabinet sure, afterwards? I to say, it's entirely a matter of the Prime Minister what job one does. Think, think in particular, how are you going to get more women elected to Parliament? 
Well, we're doing pretty well on that. At the, at the last election um, of the 39 or 40 new Labour members of Parliament, two-thirds were women. So we are uh, doing well on that, and I think as well as we probably could to do it with the view to ending up with, with at a 50-50 situation, which is where we should be. It's the other parties who are um, way behind and whose record is lamentable. One last thing. Um, on laws reform, is there anything a Labour Party member is supposed to be doing right now? Well, I hope, um, thinking about this, and I would like to suggest they think about it, look at the white paper, it's on the web, and say, yes, um, our Lords, we were 50-50, or perhaps a few more than 50-50, are elected, is a good idea. This is not the most radical thing the Labour Party's ever suggested. Um, so we ought to be getting on with it. And so, so say yes, respond to the white paper, or email so their MP? or Email their MP, well, we, regardless of uh, which constituency they live in. Um, say yes to the white paper or a bit more um, and say we ought to do it. Okay. Jack Shaw, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Excuse me.